Well, if you were in Grace Life this morning, you heard from Curtis Wentling, and he spoke from the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Well, I'll be doing the same this morning, a little different perspective, and we know did not cooperate uh, and coordinate this together. Uh, Maybe we should have, but we didn't. And so we will be in the same passage this morning. So if you were in Grace Life, you might want to put your finger on that first verse that we started, which will be very easy for you. It's the first book of the Bible, the first verse. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. In 1982, Reader's Digest published another of its famous condensed books, the Bible. After all, they were masters at condensing major classics to shorter abridged editions, easily consumed in an evening for over 30 years. Why not the Bible? Their motivation was such a project, with such a project was, and I quote, a principal motivation stemmed from a perceived paradox that while the Bible is the all-time best-selling book, Digest Editions felt that it was also one of the least read of all important books because of its length and repetitious style, obstacles that the editors eventually decided they could overcome. The team of seven Reader's Digest editors was headed by John E. Walsh, and their efforts over three years consulting with many Bible scholars, I put that in quotes, uh, produced a Bible that was 50% shorter than our current Old Testament and 25% shorter than our current New Testament. Walsh told the New York Times on September 22, 1982, Our Bible is still the Word of God, but it's easier to get into and stay with and appreciate. Now, you might be thinking, interesting, but does that have anything to do with what the gospel according to Genesis is about? Good question. Before we dive into our text this morning and our passages that we'll be looking at, Just a few words about the Bible in general, and the Old Testament and Genesis specifically. To look at that, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. In his concluding verse, testimony of the things that Jesus did and said at his first advent. So turn to John chapter 21, and let's look at verse 25. John says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Our Bibles, our copies of God's Word, already is a condensed version of God's Word. As you read your Bible, as you read the historical accounts and the narratives of the Old Testament, of which Genesis is most all one of those narratives, have you not longed to know more of the details which God hasn't given? In fact, should you muse upon those and not get uh, those not given details, you could get lost on some rabbit trails. Why didn't God give us more of those details? As we venture this morning into the details God did give us, it's my aim for you to leave this place this morning marveling at the infinite wisdom of God. To having begun, uh, given us vivid details in what is important, to know the yet sparing and yet sparing us of other details that would likely lead us away or 
at the least, clutter our thinking with the real message that God wants us to get. A message most vital that we understand and embrace if we are to receive for the, uh, receive for the salvation of our souls. It is important to know the focus on what the Bible is all about. The Word of God to redeem His creation back to Himself and all for His glorification. Yes, there are many times when the Word of God is repetitious. I find myself at times reading in the book of Numbers, as I did just this last week, chapter 1, talks about the tribes of Israel bringing forth the young men and counting them in a census. And each tribe gives the number of men who were 20 years old and older, ready to be part of the army of Israel. And if you read that passage, it's rather lengthy, but every paragraph is exactly the same on each tribe. And you say, well, yeah, I guess you could take that and condense it down and just say the words and then just put all the numbers for the various tribes. And I must admit, I tended to read it that way. Repetition is there for a reason, though. What we have to realize is that probably in the case of such texts that I just mentioned was probably to be a part of Israel's record of genealogies and other things that were actually becoming government records, if you will, for the nation of Israel. Many of these records later on when we read lists of names over like in First Chronicles, the first nine or ten chapters, and some of these others, or that were actually consulted in times of need when, when they had to verify who was a Jew and who was not. And who could partake of some of the blessings of the nation of Israel, their lands that they possessed, and all of those things were part of those records that were kept in Scripture so that they could know how to proceed. Many of the laws that God gave were repeated over and over and over and over. If you've listened to our pastor very long, you know that he spends quite a bit of time each Sunday when he preaches to us, giving us a review of what was done in the previous week in the chapter. I hope you never tire of that, because we always need reminding. We always need to remember the things that God has said. And if God only said them one time, I wonder how easy it would be for us to forget them and and just shove them off into some obscure little corner. It's quite evident to me when I was looking online to see how many of those Reader's Digest condensed Bibles are still available. You can buy one. You can actually buy a first edition of that book for about $7.95. Very valuable book, wasn't it? (laughs) I wonder if it did really help people to increase their reading of God's Word. I tend to think not. So when you get into the Old Testament, where we find a lot of this, quote, repetition, yes, maybe your time of the day and so forth, etc., may cause you to skim through it a little bit. But I hope that at some time when you're reading those passages, like in Leviticus, where it It describes the offerings that God requires, and he goes over the same details with various types of offerings. God, in his wisdom, gives that information because he wants Israel to know exactly what they are supposed to do. And it is hopeful that maybe the first time you read it, or the second, or the third time you read it, maybe it doesn't quite get past the cursory thinking of our minds. But maybe that fourth time, it'll have that convicting power that God wants to use to change our lives. So, God's Word is a condensed version of God's words. 
I know God has said far more than what we have in our Bibles. So why has he given it to us in this manner? Today, we will be exploring the redemption of God for his creation. He gave it to us in Genesis, particularly in chapters 1 through 5. And by the way, that's a correction on the bulletin this morning. It says chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. We're going to be looking at chapters 1 through 5. Now, relax. I won't read all five of the chapters. <laughs> we will look at selected scriptures this morning. But keep one key thought in mind as you read and study God's Word. You will not be frustrated by the information God does not give you, and you will marvel at the detail of information He does give you. Ask yourself the question, what is the theme of the Bible? One word, redemption. You keep that in mind, if then... You'll never go astray when you're reading God's Word. And you'll never question, well, God, why did you say that? And you probably won't be too disappointed in the fact that he leaves a few details out of some of the issues because they're not the important details of what God wants us to know. It is also important to remember for today as we go through this material that that Genesis portrays God in three important roles. First of all, creator. And along with that, and as we see time proceeding, even after man's fall, we see God as sustainer. The one that holds it all together. I've often said, if God were to turn his attention away, to take his hands off his creation, it would go back to the nothingness from which it came It exists because of God's word that spoke it into existence. He is the sustainer. And finally, he is the redeemer. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We've all read this verse, I'm sure, many times. doesn't take long to say it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Clearly, God is here stated to be the creator. But even before that, notice simply, in the beginning, God. Now, what beginning are we talking about? We're not talking about God's beginning. He has no beginning. He's always been. You ever try to wrap your mind around that? It's impossible. We know of nothing except God that never had a beginning. Everything on this planet had a beginning. Everything, including this planet, had a beginning. And by the way, it wasn't 14 or 15 billion years ago. I'll hasten to say it could have been if God wanted to do it that way, but he did not. He did it in six days. Six days. But when we look at those first four words, in the beginning, God, I want you to focus on the name of God. In the Hebrew, the word is Elohim. Elohim. You've probably heard that before. I'm sure you've heard messages you going back to this Hebrew word, it's a masculine plural plural noun, meaning God, capital G, God. It can also be, but it's very rarely done this way, applied to gods, false gods. It can refer to judges. It can refer to angels. But those, those occurrences are very, very minimal throughout the word of God. That word, that Hebrew word, is used 2,600 times in the Old Testament. So we come across it often. This word commonly designates the one true God. Genesis 1-1, of course, as we've just read. And is often paired with God's unique name, Yahweh. 
When the word is used as the generic designation of God, it conveys in the scripture that God is the creator. In Psalm 47, 7, and eight other times in the Psalms, he's declared with that name as king. In Psalm 50, verse 6, as the judge and as the Lord in Psalm 86, 12, and the Savior in Hosea 13, 4. His character is compassionate in Deuteronomy 4, 31. He's gracious in Psalm 116, 5, and faithful to his covenant in Deuteronomy 7, 9. The plural form of this word may be regarded as one, an intensity intensive to indicate God's fullness of power, or number two, as majestic to indicate God's kingly rule, and especially here in our passage in Genesis as an allusion to the Trinity, because it is a plural noun. We further see the Trinity in Genesis 1.26. Just turn your page if you need to, but maybe it's on the same page. It says, then God said, let us, notice the us, that's a plural word, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Also, we see it in John 1, 1 through 5. Curtis read that passage this morning. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So now we see that Jesus Christ was right there present with God the Father when the world was created. And of course, we hear about the Spirit moving upon the waters in the darkness. There's the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to suggest to you even for a moment that we worship three gods. We do not. We worship one God. And that's the mystery of the Trinity. We know God is one, but we know God is in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Continuing on in that passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm sorry, back up to verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I'm sure you all know that when it talks about the Word, being God and with God, It's talking about Jesus Christ, because this first chapter of John is putting forth Jesus Christ as the Messiah and pointing out that he came into a dark world. That's why it says in verse 5 that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Life from the self-existent one is breathed into man, because It says further that he is the light of men. The light of men. These are synonymous. One produces the other. Christ came the first time into a dark, sinful, sin-laden world of darkness and death. Death cannot comprehend life and light. When life from God, through Christ was breathed into the first man, he came to life and was full of light. Light reveals truth. But, as we will be reading, Adam chose death and darkness at the fall. Description of what took place at that fall is in Genesis chapter 3. You might want to turn over there. And it's culminated with how Eve responded to the devil's, the serpent's temptation in Genesis 3, verse 6. 
Keep in mind, these are the thoughts of Eve after she listened to the lies that Satan told her through the serpent. I assume probably hanging on to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and how did she know that? Well, serpent had told her, you eat the fruit, you won't die. And that it was a delight to the eyes. It's not always the way of sin. And that the tree was desired to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. I don't know if Adam was directly there with Eve at the time that the serpent spoke to her, but he was very close by. Because notice what it says. She gave to her husband with her, (laughs) and he did eat. Note what follows. First of all, one of the things that they try to do, they, they understand now that they don't have any clothes on. And they're ashamed of that, so they try to sew some fig leaves together. Is that not the works of man trying to solve his own problems? I can remember as a kid, we had a fig tree in our backyard. So I remember a little bit about the fig tree. And I think those leaves were a poor substitute for covering up nakedness. But that's what they had, and that's what they chose to try and do. Verse 8 of our chapter, Genesis 3, says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. You think that was successful? Verse 9 says, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Uh, Do you think God didn't know where they were, by the way? We have a number of these in Scripture where we call them anthropomorphic manifestations. In other words, where God allows him to be described in human terms. God wasn't really curious as to where man was hiding out. But he does bring it into a perspective at least that we can understand where God says, where are you? And then Adam responds, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Again, God asks another question that he already knows the answer to. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? God knows the answers to all these questions. In fact, he has known the answers to all of those questions long before he ever created the heavens and the earth. He knew the answer to those questions. But he wants Adam to respond in hopes that Adam will see the error of his way. And yet what we see in verse 2 or 12, that Adam is fully a sinner. It says, the man said, "Uh, the woman whom you gave to me. So he's blaming his wife and ultimately he's blaming God because God's the one that gave him his wife. She gave me from the tree. Oh, and by the way, I ate. I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, God goes ahead and follows Adam's line of reasoning. Okay, the woman's to blame. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And God goes ahead and follows that line of reasoning. And so the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle 
more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go all the days of your life. And dust you will eat. Sorry, I skipped that one. That's dealing with the created being of the serpent that allowed Satan to possess him. God curses that serpent. And by the way, that curse prevails to today, right? We all know about snakes, and they don't have legs, do they? And they do crawl on their bellies. And I imagine they do eat a lot of dust with their head that close to the ground. More importantly is what God has to say to the other serpent, the serpent that possessed the serpent. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, if you've been under the hearing of the Word of God very long, I'm sure you've heard many messages that deal with that verse. That verse is considered to be the first presentation of the gospel in the Word of God. And I think that's pretty amazing. Because when you think of the timeline here of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, and this gospel message that comes out of verse 15, think how quickly God has a solution to the sin problem that he tells man he's going to take care of it. Right there, just right out of the chute. It's like it's just moments after the fall. Adam and Eve had enough time to try to sew some fig leaves together and come to think of it, that might have taken quite a while actually. But at the same time, as soon as God is present and ready to fellowship with man whom he knows has already broken the covenant that God tried to make with him about being righteous and following him. I mean, have you ever wondered And again, this is one of those white spaces in the Bible, so we have to be a little careful. But have you ever wondered why God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? And why he commanded man not to eat of it? And by the way, you know where that rabbit trail can take you very quickly? Well, God, I guess it's your fault. If you hadn't put that tree there, it wouldn't have happened. We'd all still be in the garden. Well... No. And by the way, God didn't want man to be able to have a free will to make his own choice of whether to worship God or to worship the world. That, that isn't why God put it there either. God knows all things. He knew that man would sin before he ever created him. I want you to think about heaven for a moment. Who's in heaven? Besides God and the angels, who's in heaven? Well, people are in heaven. Matt Cole's there right now, worshiping in the feet of his Savior. How did he get there? Well, yes, death had to overtake him, but how did he get to heaven? He got to heaven because the God of all things, the God, the owner and creator of all things, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for him and brought Matt to himself. And saved him. That is true of every single human being that is in heaven Right now. Every single human being. We're going to be tonight looking at Noah. Noah got saved just like you got saved. He came to Christ in the very same manner. Now, did he have all the information that we have? No, he didn't. 
But does that keep God from justifying a sinner? Did Christ have to yet future? Did, did Noah have to wait in the grave for all those years until Jesus came and did his work on the cross for him to be saved and able to be in God's presence in heaven? No. You know, Curtis mentioned it this morning. What about the element of time? That's part of God's creation, just like everything else is. And time is not a factor for God. So the redemption of Christ on the cross for sinners, in fact, what does the Bible tell us? In Ephesians, it says he chose us be, when? Before the foundation of the world. That's as it were that God saved us or considered us a member of his family, his child, before the world was even ever created. It blows my mind to think that, that God has had Ed Oath in his mind for all eternity. I mean, we've all heard the, the idea that has it occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God didn't think of it later. God didn't decide, it does say we were chosen, but we've always been chosen because in the mind of God, it's always been there. I realize I'm talking about things that, that blow us away in our thinking, but uh, the, whole, the whole point is, is that Christ's redemption on the cross is stated right here in verse 15 and even though it does speak of it as a future event, it was already done. It's a sure thing. It's been accomplished. In eternity past, in eternity present, and in eternity future. It is said of God that He exists in the eternal now. And that's what our redemption is, folks. And it's right here in that 15th verse of the book of Genesis. So we see that uh, God is also the sustainer in the fact that, first of all, he, he provided the right kind of garments for Adam and Eve. Things that would last a little bit longer, right? It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That's verse 21 of our third chapter. And then in verses 22 through 24, listen to this. It says, then, God, then the Lord God said, Behold, and he's speaking to himself in the Trinity, Behold, the man has become like one of us. There's that same us that we had back in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, Let us make man in our own image. He says, he's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Well, yes, but God does not know good and evil by virtue of experience. God knows good and evil because he knows that everything rests upon either your obedience or your disobedience to him. He is the creator. He is the one who set it all in place. And it's all his standard that must be met. And that's how God knows good and evil. Not by the same experience that Adam and Eve went through. And now, God is making the point, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. He said, oh man, if Adam had just eaten of that tree, you know, before he sinned. What a travesty that would have been. And I think God kept him from it until, because he knew he would fall. 
And if any of us were to receive eternal life in our current condition, what a curse that would be. Because then sin and death would be living in us for all eternity. And that is not the will of God. That is actually a merciful God that kept man from partaking of that tree of life after the fall. What a curse that would be. Life from the self-existent one. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Yes, God was protecting them. He was the protector in that he protects them from having to live for eternity in darkness and death. We'll see more of that on a broader scale tonight. As we see or saw in Genesis 3.15, God immediately makes the distinction between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Chapters 4 and 5 follow the lineage, first of all, of the seed of the serpent, and then the lineage of the seed of the woman. And we'll see that as we get into those. We will not read all the genealogies, so I'll spare you of that, although I actually find them quite interesting. As contained in Genesis 4, 1 through 8, we have the account of Cain murdering his brother, Abel. For the sake of time, we're not going to read that passage, but instead I want you to turn over to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. And the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed, see that word seed, his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, John uses absolute statements at times. Notice he says he can't sin because he's of the seed of God. He cannot practice sin. He will not practice sin. A true believer does not practice sin. He's not one that just sins every time the occasion arises to tempt him just a little bit and he goes ahead and sins. A true believer doesn't do that because he's of the seed of God. Whereas one who is not a true believer does. And notice that uh, it seems to tack on that phrase at the end of verse um, 10 by saying, nor, nor the one who does not love his brother. Verse 11, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, there's, there's Cain there in their passage, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for that reason, or what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Because that's the way of the world, is hate. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Jesus said it, says, by this shall all men know you are my disciples by your love, one for the other. He who does not love abides in death. Yes, well, we saw that, we see that keenly in this chapter 4 when we witness the occurrence of Cain killing his brother. That definitely was death in that case, was it not? 
He who does not love abides in death. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount, remember? The, the Pharisees thought they were doing well because they weren't committing murder. And Jesus points out, you know, if you hate your brother, it's like murder. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Unless he's a pardoned murderer, of which can only happen if Christ brings them to himself. But as a murderer, as a practicing murderer, does not have life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. Ah, it goes right to the perfect example, doesn't it? Jesus Christ. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So Christ is showing us by his example what level of love is to be expected for the brethren. What is it? That you would even lay down your life for them. That's the kind of love that we're talking about. That's the life, the love that Christ demonstrated when he went to the cross. Hebrews 11.4 tells us a little bit more about Abel's faith. And, and you may want to turn there, but I'm going to read it right away. So, But Hebrews 4.11 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. And you say, well, okay, because Abel offered sheep and Cain only offered of the fruit of the ground. Is that the reason? Not in and of itself. It had to do with his heart, where his heart was. Through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Abel was righteous before God because God declared him righteous. It wasn't because he offered the right sacrifice. It was because he believed what God said to do, and he did it with a heart that wanted to please his Lord. It's said much of the same way with Abraham in, in Galatians 3.6. It says, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. You see, without the justification that God gives to the sinner, he can't be saved. It's impossible. If God doesn't justify you, if God doesn't pardon you from your sin, you will never be a true believer. Can't happen. It's impossible. It takes God's justification. It takes God's pardon of your sin. And he can only do that because of what Jesus paid on the cross for our sin which, by the way, was also God's ideas, be, idea because he sent Jesus to do that. And he said so way back in Genesis 3.15. Again, the gospel in that passage. Cain through murder, revealed that he was of the seed of the devil. And through the rest of Genesis 4, we will follow his lineage all the way through the seventh, you might even be able to say the eighth generation from Adam to Lamech and then Lamech's children through his two wives would be the eighth generation, demonstrating how progressive sin had become. Let's take a look at Lamech for a moment. Genesis 4, verses 19 through 24. Now, he is the seventh generation from Adam. In verse 19, it says, Lamech took to himself two wives. Stop right there. There's the progression of sin in mankind since the fall of Adam, seven generations later to Lamech through Cain. 
Lamech takes two wives. How many wives did God give to Adam? One. Multiple wives is not the will of God. Sorry, in spite of the fact that men like David and Solomon, who were righteous men that God loved, and I believe I will see them in heaven, they sinned in having more than one wife. <laughs> God was never pleased with that. That's another thing you need to understand about the Word of God. God's Word a lot of times tells us a lot of things, and it doesn't say come right out and say that was sin. It just reports what was done. There are many other passages that help us to understand what's sin and what isn't. And so use your discernment when you read of these kinds of things and realize that was sin. That's what that was. And Lamech commits that sin. We don't know if he was the first that did it, but it is the only place or he is the first one spoken of in the Bible as having more than one wife. It says the name of one was Ada and the name of the other was Zillah. Verse 20 Ada gave birth to Jubal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So this was an entrepreneur, apparently, that knew how to raise livestock and get rich by doing that. Uh, Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and a pipe. Okay, so he was a music guy. And then for Zillah, in verse 22, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. So he was a metallurgist, a blacksmith, if you will, that was able to create things from the elements of the earth, the metals that he was able to forge these things from. And then it mentions, and a sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, a boy for striking me. You know what that is, by the way? That's murder. He was struck by the boy, and he killed the boy. That's murder. And he thinks, because apparently the boy struck him, he thinks that if Cain has avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So he's not only a murderer, but he's a justifier of his act of murder. So this is where evil has progressed. Yes, I know it's no more serious than Cain murdering his brother, but on the other hand, can you see the progression of depravity? It's also interesting that when we read the genealogies of the sons of Cain, and then we move into chapter 5 and we see the sons of Seth, no accomplishment is assigned to any of those ten generations of, uh, from Adam through Noah. No accomplishment is mentioned about them. And yet, here's these guys of the sinful seed of the devil in the world, and it talks about their achievements. Well, they're earthbound. So it talked about their earthbound achievements. I think it's really a testimony of the fact that the true believer's testimony is founded in Christ, and they can take no credit for it whatsoever. I'm sure Tubal Cain and these other guys probably thought they were pretty important people because of their discoveries and their abilities. But as it says in Isaiah, all our righteousness is filthy rags. So we see that after the eighth generation of the sons and daughters of Lamech, we are nothing more about the seed of the serpent through Cain. As we see, as we will see tonight, All man's depravity comes to a head in Genesis chapter 6, and we will talk about that tonight. So when we get into this final genealogy here in chapter 5, 
I'm not going to again read from the list that's there, which is Genesis 5, verses 3 through 32. Instead, I want you to go to a shorter passage, and it's over in the book of Luke. So turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke 3, starting with verse 36b. And I'll just say at the outset right here, this whole long list of names that are in this section of Scripture, which starts back verses before this, we know as the genealogy of Jesus Christ, starting with Jacob, his assumed father, which was not actually the father of Christ, but he was the legal father, the one recognized as father. And so we're following the lineage of Jacob all the way down to Adam in the book of Luke. And we have here in verse, and it's going backwards, okay, in time. So keep that in mind. 36b, we have Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. This is not the same Lamech, by the way. This is another Lamech the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. Notice the son of God. He was the son of God because God created him. So what we are seeing here in Luke is the same genealogy we'll have in chapter 5. You can check it out later. Okay, Chapter 5 gives that lineage, and it's the same lineage of Jesus Christ. This is the seed of the woman that God is protecting and making sure that it isn't so polluted and messed up that it's not able to accomplish what that lineage will accomplish in Jesus Christ. As we'll see tonight in in chapter 6 of Genesis, there was a great effort on the part of the devil to confound that division between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. We'll see that as we come tonight. So let me wrap this up for this morning. Two seeds in Genesis 3.15 needed God's intervention to maintain the division or enmity through the ages of man's sinful history until the birth of Christ. Almost 4,000 years that God preserves that enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And if we had the time, we could trace many attempts on Satan's part to mess that up but he was not successful. And it was because of God's preservation of those two seeds that the third seed was able to come in and accomplish the work of God. And that third seed was the seed of the Holy Spirit impregnating Mary, the to-be mother of Jesus Christ. And the pinnacle of it, because go back to Genesis 3.15 for a moment. Notice what it says. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who is that woman? Ultimately, that's Mary, the mother of Christ. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. And then notice what, we have a pronoun right after that. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a person, and that person, of course, we know as Jesus Christ, who accomplished everything that was needful. It's called propitiation. Propitiation is the offering of a gift for the appeasement of wrath. God's wrath rested upon all mankind. And Jesus satisfied that price that had to be paid to appease that wrath 
by going to the cross, dying on the cross, providing everything we need for God to be able to look down on us sinful creatures that he chose before the foundation of the world to be his children, to look down upon us and not see our unrighteousness, but instead see the imputed righteousness of Christ as a cloak, if you will, a blanket, if you will, that's covering us so that when God looks at us, he sees only what Christ accomplished. And have you noticed? It's all his work. There's not a single part of it that has anything to do with us. It's all his work. Decided that it would happen in eternity past. That's why you can't just be good and go to heaven. You're too far gone. You're born of Adam's race. You're cursed under the curse of sin. And the only way it can be made right is when God brings you under conviction of your sin. You see, that's part of the process that God uses. You can't know your sin unless God reveals it to you in a manner that he also then supplies you the ability to repent, to turn from that sin and put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. It all comes from him. And if you're sitting there this morning and you're hearing these words and you're thinking, hmm, I know nothing of what you're talking about in my actual life. And you sense some level of conviction that says, I should probably do something about this. That may be the very work of the Holy Spirit on you to be bringing you to that place of salvation. If it is, he will accomplish that work. But at the same time, don't resist it either. That isn't to say that you can resist it to the point of being lost. If he's chosen you before the foundation of the world, you will be his child at some point in history. But God tells us today, Today is the day of salvation. If he's speaking to your heart, don't resist it. Come to him. Let's bow in prayer. Father, it's been our joy to look into your word this morning, and we haven't even begun to plumb to the depths of what it has to say to us about these things that you have ordained for those whom are your children. Father, you've also told us in your word that it's not your will that any should perish. But the fact is, Lord, many do perish. So, Father, hear our prayers and when we pray for those we know are lost. And we pray that somehow you would accomplish that work of salvation in our lives. We don't know, only you know, But our trust is in you and our faith is in you. Thank you for your word. I pray that you'll use it to speak to our hearts and conform us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.